Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Digital Grocer, Mercatus' very own podcast, episode 23. It's actually the end of season two. Yes, it is. Is that right, Mark? Yes, it is. And this is your host, Sylvain Perrier, president and CEO of Mercatus Technologies. And joining me in the studio today is Mercatus' very own senior director of marketing, Mark Fairhurst. It's good to be back. It's good to be back. And it's, you know, Christmas is just literally around the corner. Mm -hmm. I think, what, two weeks now? A week? Ten Uh, days. Hopefully, it's two weeks because I haven't done any shopping. No, I have not done any shopping. And we are without our trusted engineer. So I'm going to apologize way ahead of time right now. Kevin is sick. Uh, Bubonic plague is what I've been told. (laughs) You got to stop giving that to him. (laughs) Well, I thought it was smallpox. You know, it is. Smallpox is in fashion now, by the way. Is it? I apologize for everyone who's listening who may have smallpox or have had a distant, very old relative. Now, is is that because... The anti-vaxxers? The anti-vaxxers. Probably. I don't know anymore. I don't... It's really hard to follow this. It's making a comeback. You know, in my district where I live, Mark, the school boards are actually putting their foot down. If you refuse certain vaccines, your child can be sent home. Yeah. For the common good. Yeah. Of everyone. Right. In my opinion, it makes sense. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree with that. But, you know, everyone's entitled to their opinion, right? That's right. the beauty about living in a democracy. Mm-hmm. And apparently that's what I'm told. <laughs> right. But in any case, <laughs> so today we have, it's kind of an interesting show. And, you know, and we're going to be bouncing around here on a, a bunch of topics. It's the 2019 wrap up. There's been a lot of stuff that's happened in the industry. We're going to be talking about, you know, the predictions that were published in, I think it was, was it Grocery Dive that pu- uh, published yes. the Mercatus yep. 2020 predictions? That's right. We'll talk about kind of a new way of measuring customer value. So CLTV, customer lifetime value, mm-hmm. it's something that's more traditionally used in the SaaS industry, Mark? Yeah, it is. I mean, it's, it's not a metric that I think typically is used uh, amongst uh, our industry, in, mm-hmm. in the grocery industry mm-hmm. in, in particular, mm-hmm. but in the technology SaaS world mm-hmm. uh, where I come from and then you've been immersed for yeah quite some time, a lot of years. Um, yeah. It is definitely one of the key benchmarks. Yeah for any subscription service. Yeah, it's also also what we're finding in you know, in our world, right? Because mm-hmm. we do B2B sales, you know, to to our retailers and we right. license our technology. And it's a very focused sales and marketing process. Correct. So we deal with stuff like marketing funnels, sales funnels, and that's something we don't hear about in the grocery space. No, it's it's kind of bizarre if yeah. you, if you think about it. It's a grocer is they need to cultivate the relationship with mm-hmm. the shopper. Mm-hmm. They obviously would like to get more shoppers in their stores. Right. And especially for the retailers that have loyalty programs, there's no reason why they can't do that. Exactly. I mean, that's the whole reason for having a loyalty program. Exactly. Is to I, keep the shopper coming back. Absolutely. Now, the kind of the last subject we'll tackle on the show today is we just got back from New York City. Mm-hmm. I think it was literally a week ago. Right. Um, we were invited to the Barclays event. Mm-hmm. Eat, Eat, sleep. Play, play, pray. I don't know. <laughs> there was no was, pray part of it. No, no, no. <laughs> it was a great event. It was serendipitous. We yes. were we were invited to the event by Karen Short. Karen mm-hmm. was a guest. I think it would have been mid season two. We we're talking about. I think the title was the myth about Instacart. Yeah, the Instacart addiction. Yeah, the Instacart addiction. Correct. And then she was on the show mm-hmm. and she dialed in from New York and we right. had a bunch of stuff. Oh, Emmy's coming in. Emmy. Emmy's in our marketing team. She's uh, an integral part of the marketing and Yeah, yes. she is. And she's going to be watching us recording today. Yes. And if we do something wrong, she'll throw something at us, I'm <laughs> sure. So let's start with the predictions. Let me kind of go to these prediction things. People always kind of ask me how hard are they to kind of come up with and so on. Kind of the reality about when you go through some of these things, it's not like there's a dartboard in my office and then I just throw something out there. Is the reality is that it really comes about from talking to people in the space, whether it's a CMO, whether it's a CIO, and just listening also to the undercurrent. And what I call the undercurrent is you know, attending vendor meetings, mm-hmm. attending vendor presentations, attending, quite frankly, a majority of the trade shows in the space, mm-hmm. whether it's grocery shop, whether it's uh, FMI Midwinter, well, it's not so much of a trade show, but it's a gathering of retailers, or quite frankly, going into WCAG in California and so on. And then you kind of cultivate these contacts in the space and then you kind of find out what's happening. And then you know, reading the trades and not just the, the traditional trades in the grocery space, but also just consuming a tremendous amount of media. Right. The really big thing out of the 2020 predictions 
that stood out for me in any case is the notion of marketplaces. Mm -hmm. And and that's kind of mixed with the first prediction that we publish on Grocery Dive, which is the reverse Amazon model. Right. And it was interesting because the moment we had submitted our predictions, was it Loblaws? <laughs> <laughs> it was, I think it was the day after. Yeah that the article was published that Loblaws, which is the largest grocery retailer in Canada, mm -hmm. had announced that they have launched their their marketplace for drop ship products. Yeah, but Mark, they did something a bit different as opposed mm -hmm. to partnering. They decided to buy the technology outright. Outright. The team now made I think part of Loblaw Digital. Yeah. The company uh, they purchased was PF Tech out of Las Vegas. Yeah, Las Vegas. And they, I think they've been working on this for the last year. It's really odd. We don't see a lot of tech coming out of Las Vegas. It may be that there's an undercurrent right. of tech companies there that we just aren't aware of. Yeah. But obviously Loblaws knew about them. Yeah, they did. Did they move them? Do you know? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. So in any case, what, what the concept was is essentially we know that in the world of Amazon, what truly makes them interested in grocery aside from the data is grocery has an extremely high household penetration rate something north of 95 percent so okay so what does that mean is essentially majority of the u.s consumers are actually buying groceries at least 1.x times a week so one call it 1.2 to 1.5 in e-commerce we're seeing 1.6 to 1.9 so it really really depends and then you go down into the other verticals in retail and then that household penetration rate seamlessly gets much lower. Now, we know that a majority of U.S. adults actually use Amazon.com. Mm -hmm. We know that from our own research. I remember when we did research out in the West Coast, 86 to 92% of the households we actually surveyed were using Amazon on a monthly basis. And if you look at Amazon's core verticals and what they do, right? So it's not just about selling things online. It's about enabling the consumption of media. So their prime videos, their music, and so on. Mm -hmm. They've also gotten into the more commoditized space with the Echo devices and so on. They tried their hands at phones, which was a catastrophic failure for them. Right. And also their whole tablets and so on. So for them is getting more eyeballs more frequently, consuming content as well as potentially buying something. So getting into the grocery space makes sense. So if you're a grocer and you have a lot of weekly visits, so let's take Walmart, for example. There was this wonderful book that was written on Walmart. Can't even remember the title. I ended up reading it and buying the, uh, the audio tapes for those of you who may re remember cassettes. Just a brief interruption. This is Emmy. Let me throw in a little insight here. The book that Sylvan is trying to recall is The Walmart Effect by Charles Fishman. And listening this into my car, and there was a famous quote in the book, which was 90% of the United States. Now, this would have been in the 90s, right? So 90% of the United States actually lives less than 16 miles from a Walmart. Yeah, I would believe it. And that's pretty impactful. It's probably even more now. Right. And so we know they're the largest mm -hmm. seller of food in the United States. They actually, I think they eclipse Kroger. I'm pretty sure they do. If they don't, I apologize. That no, they do. They okay, do. they do. So yeah. if you know that, so that means Walmart has a high household penetration rate. So why wouldn't they in their dot-com space layer in a marketplace? And if you take that concept even further to a traditional grocer who does, she doesn't do hard lines or soft lines. I don't know. A good example could be an H-E-B, mm -hmm. could be a smaller retailer like a Schnucks uh, in the St. Louis market. If you go out and you layer in a marketplace which enables organizations to come in through your dot com to sell items, dishware, cookware, barbecues. I mean, the list goes on. Anything that's complementary to food, I'm not yet convinced that this needs to be like a Best Buy approach. Right Or in the day where a lot of these electronic retailers went out and s actually stopped selling what was called white goods, mm -hmm. white goods being refrigerators, washers, and dryers, right. and they replaced it with you know the DVDs and CD racks, and you know some of these comp USA would have been their downfall, quite frankly, and some other ones. Um, but if, if you take the concept of adding items to your marketplace, you have the eyeballs. The margins are excessive. I've been told the the return on investment on some of these marketplace solutions is a 10 to 1. That's amazing. Which is amazing. But for the retailer, quite frankly, 
if you do it right, mm -hmm. and I'm doing it right is understanding where your brand and where your brand needs to go from a business perspective, it can be extremely powerful in terms of the margin that you can make. So that's what we dubbed at Mercatus, the reverse Amazon model. I applaud Loblaws for doing it in yep. Canada. It's yep. gutsy. To your point, yeah. they will be curating the content, the products. Yes that will be complementary to their president's choice brands. Well, this also makes them a formidable challenger, not only to Amazon here in Canada, which Amazon dominates e-commerce here mm -hmm. and for food in the Canadian space. But what it also does is it puts them head to head now with Walmart from a digital perspective here in this country, yep. which is great for them. Yeah, competition's good. Yeah, it, <laughs> competition's always great. Well, you know, in Canada, we have three retailers that own 88% of the marketplace. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and but you know, let's also understand we have some amazing niche, smaller grocery retailers in the Kenyan space that are independent or sometimes are owned by some larger conglomerates that are people are fanatical about and do quite well. I mean, if you think of Farm Boy, mm -hmm. Friesen over in, and Brothers over in Alberta, yep, and then you have Longos. In mm -hmm. the GTA, mm -hmm. and um, I'm an exclusive shopper to Longos, and you know why? Because the produce is amazing. The staff is extremely efficient and friendly, and, and the quality of the goods throughout the store yeah, and, is and the stores top are notch. clean. And I, I'm a destination shopper, mm -hmm. so to go into a box that's 150,000 square feet just numbs my mind for yeah. some reason. It's kind yeah. of like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm here for the food experience first, and I think everything else, like the more hard lines and soft lines, uh, I'm less of a. I don't have that exploration bug in me to want to kind of go through those things. I want to get in and out as fast as possible. That's you know, pretty critical. Now, one of the other predictions that we made that's very topical for, for the podcast is, you know, we called it the commoditization of, of delivery. When you hear the word commoditization, some people may think, oh, my God, that's really scary in terms of what does that mean? But at the end of the day, I think we've seen the, the pendulums swing really far towards delivery. To the point where some of our organizations have really stifled the innovation capabilities of a lot of the retailers that are using some of these technologies, and the ecosystem has, has been shut out. And a lot of 2019 was focused for us on talking about, in that case, around Instacart. Mm -hmm. you know, we've gotten a lot of phone calls and a lot of LinkedIn messages saying how we're unfairly picking on Instacart. And the reality is that it's not just an, an Instacart conversation. What well, we're trying to open the eyes of the, the retailers here and to say, hey, listen, at the end of the day, you as a retailer, you own your brick and mortar, you own everything around it, you own the in-store experience, you own your private label brands and so on. So why are you sacrificing everything else? And a lot of applause has come in from a lot of the ecosystem partners that also are getting shut out of that experience when a retailer decides to go with such a solution as Instacart. Yeah, yeah. just picking up on that. I mean, as the, the marketing lead, you know, I'm sensitive to the criticism that, you know, we're unfairly picking on a competitor. And to my earlier point, you know, I, I do honestly believe competition is good, pushes everyone to excel in the interest of the end customer. But at the same time, the customer needs to be educated as to what the full range of options are so they know what they're getting into. Right. And that's that's the position that I take and I think we view all of our content with that position. Yeah, I think the big difference for 2020 is a lot of the retailers are kind of understand now what we're saying and are starting to make some really tough decisions in terms of how do I get the best of both worlds? How do I enable control of my own digital roadmap mm -hmm. and at the same time bring in the right partners, not just one, to the table to really maximize the, you know, and when I say maximize, but eliminate all friction points around the customer journey. And there's one prediction we didn't write, and I was actually reflecting it on this week. There's a lack of understanding, and there's a lack of pure digital natives in the space. <laughs> yes. Right? I, I, yeah, absolutely. Where yeah. where we normally see them at Mercatus, at agencies that can actually sit down and say, hey, this is more than just a veneer on a website. It's more than just call it an operational process mm -hmm. and so on. 
what is the strategic endeavor and benefit what we're trying to achieve and how does that convert into you know into the world of digital marketing there is a lot of pretend people out there that i'm now kind of uncovering more so than ever when you start to look under the cover and start to ask questions and my fear is that we're still for some retailers in check the box mode Mm -hmm. and that's why they've gone with these more commoditized solutions i think in 2020 that's going to change or we're going to have to change it for them yeah Yeah. Um, i think there's no choice yeah and we you know we started this podcast series you know with our friend Britton lad Mm -hmm. and you know he was talking about retailers being surrounded and having to play the infinite game Mm -hmm. and being more strategic and i certainly hope that the retailers that we're encountering and, and talking to on a regular basis are really heeding that message and understanding that e-commerce online offline there is no division it's all about a unified commerce approach shoppers are going to purchase where when how they want and you need to be ready to serve that you know when i look at the landscape today there are two retailers that get this really well walmart mm-hmm. i think they have rapidly excelled uh, quite frankly not just through their acquisitions but i think in a cultural shift right in their head office they brought the right executives to the table. I think it's still the challenge for them is the balancing act between the dollars that their capital they're spending in their e-commerce mm-hmm. realm and what they're losing and the attention that they need to draw towards their brick and mortar operation. Right. I mean, they're, they're still held to a different standard than, say, Amazon is. Yeah. Amazon leverages the revenue they get from other mm-hmm. services. Correct. And there's a tolerance for Amazon to spend much more so absolutely than say at walmart absolutely absolutely the other one is target mm-hmm. i think it's a brand that you know when they came into canada i think in the u.s they were on the decline how many cyber attacks were they hit on yeah twice yep. that i can remember there's also a business that was heavily engaged with amazon in the day and they decided to pull out they had a, i think two years in a row there on the black friday they had a complete system failure so two cyber attacks damaged brand that came into the Canadian space. So they've really reinvigorated themselves and I think they've done well digitally. The acquisition of Shipped was a very interesting one. Right. And so I'm kind of curious to see where that relationship is going to go into 2020. Um, most people know that we are partnered with Shipped. Mm-hmm. I mean, we worked well with them in a couple of retailers so far to date. The one retailer uh, stepping outside of grocery, Sean Gensch, who was the former CMO over at Sprouts Farmer's Market. So he's now over at JCPenney. Oh, yeah. JCPenney. And I think mm-hmm. JCPenney has brought in Jackman here out of Toronto mm-hmm. to, to help them out. And they've opened up kind of their new, I don't want to call it flagship, but I think it's one of the, a store where they're trying to create a new immersive experience for shoppers. So they'll have a barber shop. I think they even have yoga classes inside the JCPenney. Oh, wow. Yeah, so they're really trying to go after that more millennial shopper who's got probably more disposable income and so on and so on. And I think I'm wondering if the days of, you know, JCPenney used to be known kind of like a Macy's, like an excessive amount of couponing, right? Right. I went to like a Macy's in Miami to buy a shirt and, you know, the shirt was already discounted. And because I was nice to the cashier, she pulled out a 35% off coupon when I told her I was Canadian and suddenly <laughs> I think the shirt was like $10 and it would have been a $40 shirt. It was, it was just ridiculous. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're Canadian to go to the Macy's in Miami, you'll do, you'll do, down by the Doral and then so, Doral will give you a whole other experience. As well. So what did you say to the cashier to make her? Well, she asked me if I had a Macy's card and I said, uh-huh. no, unfortunately I don't have one. I'm Canadian. And she goes, Oh my God, that's so great. And you know, I have family and I have family in Montreal and, we oui, we oui, and then, well, it was a little yeah. known fact. Canadians are like the, yeah. the, the largest tourist group attending or visiting Florida on an annual basis. Absolutely, and I would say yeah. probably in Phoenix uh, and Scottsdale yeah. as well. Right, yeah. we have people coming down from Alberta and Saskatchewan, mm-hmm. and so all these snowbirds who uh, seek the yeah. warm weather. Yeah. yeah, shout out to everyone in Regina. Yeah. <laughs> so the other prediction that we put forward was recession proofing. Yeah, the company and. It's a tough one because the five U.S. economical drivers coming in out of probably out of Q4 of this year are looking great. I mean, the U.S. added over 200,000 jobs. 
mm-hmm. in November versus Canada, where there was a decline, I think it was negative 71,000 mm-hmm. or 72,000 jobs. Um, there's some concerns here in the Canadian space. Food prices are going up here in Canada, so likely the same thing in the United States. So the commodities market is you know, shaping up in the negative side for the consumer because costs are going up. There was a trucking company that just declared bankruptcy on Monday. Uh, over 3,400 truckers were kind of stranded. The trucking market is in decline. So what's not clear, is that a result of the trade war with China? Right. That is having an adverse effect of things coming over here. I'm not seeing consumer confidence being shaking anytime soon. I think the reality is you prepare for these things in the best of times. Right. Right. And, and again, that's part of being strategic. Absolutely. And that's looking at supply chain. Right. It's actually looking at your investment in private label. You know, I remember in 08 being on the ground in Charlotte and people that would traditionally go to, you know, who could afford a Harris Teeter would go into a bottom dollar food. And then the people that couldn't afford a bottom dollar food were either going to a dollar store and if they couldn't afford that, they were going to a soup kitchen. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah. Yep. And there are some retailers in 08 who, and this is a, a testimonial to our chairman at the time, who had made massive investment in, um, along with a bunch of business partners to some shipping lines uh, that were carrying goods into the, out of China, out of Asia, into the Caribbean, out of Asia, into Vancouver, and some of the ports on, on the East Coast of the United States. Uh, they saw and they were seeing a decline already in terms of the flow of goods. Mm -hmm. So is is that one of the early indicators? It's usually an early indicator. I think the one thing that people dismiss, and there was an amazing article at the time, and I think it would have been in the Wall Street Journal, how 7-Eleven predicted the decline in the economy. So 7-Eleven is owned by a large Japanese conglomerate Mm -hmm. that, that does a tremendous amount of research. So kudos to them to, for kind of getting a, a sense of what was happening. But, you know, the prediction is, I think in 2020, you have to start, you know, focusing on your supply chain, focusing on anything where you can squeeze out costs, maximize the return on your investments inside your brick and mortar, whether that's in private label and so on. I'm always leery when I hear grocery retailers trying to fight on price against Walmart, I think that's a difficult differentiator. It's a, it's a losing game. Well, it's a losing game yeah. because it's a race to the bottom. Right. Right, you know, so that's why certain grocers do excessively well, like a farm boy, right? like an HEB, and so on and so on. It's not that they're more ex- necessarily more expensive, but they focus on quality and, and, and experience. And the ratio with price yeah. and the experience in store and so on. And I think there are certain retailers, I don't want to say they're recession-proof, but I think that they won't bleed their best customers. Right. And I think if you're a grocer, you have to be mindful of that. Yeah. On that point, it's, you know, this gets back to something we talked about earlier in the, in the show. It's making sure that you don't let anyone else come between you and your customer. Yeah. Right. So if now is the time to make the investment to secure that customer relationship, then take it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Mark, those were the 2020 predictions. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about CLTV. Yes. Now, for those of you who might not know, in the world of software as a service, right? So so SaaS, Mm -hmm. the reality is is there are a bunch of metrics that we look at in our business, right? Reoccurring revenue, you know, monthly recurring revenue, annual recurring revenue. We look at CAC. Churn. Churn. Yeah. You know, CAC's customer acquisition mm-hmm. costs. So what is it really, what's our cost of, of sale, cost of marketing for bringing right. on board a new customer? Mm-hmm. Or quite frankly, for, for the entire process of, of doing marketing. And then there's this other element of what we call CLTV, right? So CLTV stands for Customer Lifetime Value. Mm-hmm. And essentially what it is, it's just a very easy to understand metric, which is a total revenue that you could be generating or reasonably expect from a consumer, right? And I think that's in our world, that's easy to understand because we're not dealing with millions of consumers, mm-hmm. but it, it's more complex in the world of grocery retail. But the thing that I try to encourage our retailers to understand when you start to think in the context of CLTV and you start looking at 
who are your top revenue generators, right? So let's say you only have 10 clients, right? But let's assume it's millions. Mm -hmm. It's very easy for your system provider, your service provider to be able to generate a report that says, here's your top 100 customers, model them out, and then see who else fits in that quote unquote segment. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's very critical because once you start to understand those types of customers, that CLTV metric, you start to understand how do you market to those people? Does that make sense, Mark? Yeah. You can't be everything to everybody. Right. Right. In order to maximize your revenue, mm -hmm. you need to cater to that segment mm -hmm. that is generating the most value for your organization. Yeah. It's an interesting story to go along with that. I remember years ago being at a large Canadian retailer and I was with there with their CMO and we walked into the store. We're visiting the new concept that they have. So we grab a cart because we're going to pretend we're shoppers. The store didn't know who he was and no one knows who I am. So there's a flyer in the cart and the flyer literally has items that are circled with a pen. <laughs> and I look at him and I said, oh, this is, this is interesting. He goes, the challenge we have in our business today is 80% of our revenue actually comes from 20% of our shoppers. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately what happens is we have people that exclusively will own shop our flyer and it's a drain on our margin. He actually over the years developed a process to minimize as best as possible the investment in that group of consumers that erodes margin. Amazing. <laughs> That's smart. They're very smart. Yeah. And so they deployed at the time an amazing loyalty program. Yeah that they very much have leverage yeah, all big time yeah to understand CLTV yes yes and to specifically offer points yeah an easier redemption process yeah. to those top consumers and now I've started to target that middle layer of consumers that they think they can convert right to where they can get better you know more mm -hmm. of the basket and but in tandem with that mm -hmm. it's also developing this passion for data right data governance and the insights that come from proper data governance. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, data governance in, in certain retailers is non-existent, yeah. Yeah. you know, because you'll get a sense of that when you have retailers that aren't happy with their search experience on their websites or are not happy with the fact that they're missing a tremendous amount of images. Right. Or quite frankly, they can't get an alignment between the nutritional information or FDA tagging on the shelf down into what's in their e-commerce experience. And it's it's not necessarily a vendor problem. I think vendors create a lot of friction for no reason mm -hmm. in some cases, but it's really understanding the retailer may not necessarily know how to better do that. I love the background noises <laughs> in Toronto. Uh, I think there's like a fire truck or a dump truck no, doing I, something. This, this is garbage day. Oh, uh, well, at least it's not a hearse picking up a body on the street. <laughs> so anyways, so we apologize for those background noises. But in any case, yeah. But I think when you think of those things, there it's not only about sales by square foot. Yeah. It's not just that's, about gross revenue. That's, that's, a, that's, that's a very insightful comment. Yeah. And it's yeah. difficult to change that tide, right? It, it's especially, and again, going back to your, your earlier point in, in the show, when you don't have that mm -hmm. talent base that is understanding unified commerce. Right. Now, Mark, we have, we should dig this up and recirculate mm -hmm. it, but we have a piece of long form content yep. on the Mercatus blog. Actually, it was a white paper. That's uh, right. That's oh, right. It was. Or, I'm sorry, an ebook. An ebook. <laughs> an ebook. Who uses, who writes, who uses ebook anymore? Like, it's such, it's a dead form of it marketing. Is, yeah. I mean, we've been noticing that C content consumption needs yeah. to be much more. A morsel yeah. uh, sized. Yeah. We're, and, we're uh, actually going to be deploying everything through TikTok now. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, don't tell him either. I know. I know. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a great piece of content that we're yeah. going to breathe new life into mm -hmm. early in the new year. It essentially is the, the ten, top 10 metrics a grocery right. retailer needs to, to measure and follow. Yeah. And we do our best to try to work with our retailers yeah. to kind of talk through these metrics, but. It's uh, a challenge, but I encourage the listeners to go through on our website in the blog section mm -hmm. and then go through, just click. I think there's a drop down where For you resources. can filter yeah. resources yeah. and you can filter on too. Or just e reach out to either of us directly and we're happy to send it to them. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So our last topic is, you know, we were 
in New York. Yep. We stayed right in Times Square, which I will never do again. <laughs> it's a little noisy. It's not just it's noisy. It's just you're inundated with tourists. Yes. And when you're very much focused to get to your destination to do what you need to do on a daily basis, and there are somebody stops in the front of you to raise their camera to take a picture of... You didn't jump. You didn't jump in and get your photo taken. No, I'm like you know you can buy that same image with a better quality yeah. for a lot cheaper than coming here. You know, it's capturing the memories. Right. Well, yeah. <laughs> Little did they know. <laughs> but in any case, we we were invited to go to Barclays to do a fireside chat, yep. which was myself and Tom Fiorita from Point Pickup. Yep. Tom's just a really nice guy, super gentleman in the space, mm-hmm. tons of Wall Street experience. Mm-hmm. Point Pickup has what I would equate to an extremely interesting technology platform yeah. that really marries retailers with drivers to do delivery. Right. Yeah, what they call micro-level fulfillment. Yeah, and it's kind of the whole democracy behind yeah. that whole idea of pairing a retailer yeah. with a driver. Yeah. Right? So we announced, even just before we got up on stage for our one-hour session, we announced our technology partnership. We've introduced Tom to a bunch of our clients. Mm-hmm. So he's off to the races on that. Yeah. I think internally we're going to be kind of discussing what's what, how is that whole integration now going to unfold? The fireside chat was interesting. You know, we seldom, it's a different world for us, right? And we don't go, Mercatus doesn't go and, and meet with investment bankers and so on. Mm-hmm. So when you're up on stage and you're being interviewed in real time, yep. because there's not much preparation we can do as a business to that. You know, we, we started off kind of the Mercatus, what do we do? What do we work with? Mm-hmm. Tom did the exact same thing. Mm-hmm. And then Karen just opened up with her questions. And she left the, the crowd. You know, she shared an, an interesting question. Where do we see the growth of digital commerce in the grocery retail space up to 2025, right? Mm-hmm. And Karen's very specific when she wants numbers. And I, and I think, quite frankly, if you work at Barclays, I think everyone does. Right. I hesitated to answer the question because the numbers that we are seeing are very different in this space, Mm -hmm. right? We'll have IGD at Grocery Shop talked about that, you know, 2023, we're thinking US will be 60 billion. You have Mm -hmm. FMI that's going to be, that's reported 100 billion US. Canadian space is entirely different. I mean, Mm -hmm. I think we're in the 100 million range this year. Yep, a lot Uh, smaller. A lot smaller Mm -hmm. by 2023. It's probably, I think it's sub 2 billion still. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or two is it two point seven? Anyways, I can't remember. That's was from the presentation I did at the uh, Canadian Grocer event. But we're going to have a report published today by Incisive mm-hmm. that it's actually the number is closer to one hundred and fifty-seven point something billion U.S. Huge! It's the highest number that I've seen. It's by the highest number twenty twenty-five. I think there's correct. Some, yeah, correct. It's actually fifty-seven billion higher mm-hmm. than what FMI is reporting. So when I kind of said that, you know, I think Karen was like, whoa, would you get these numbers? And I kind of explained to it. I think the interesting thing about being at Barclays is the conversation is different. And Barclays has, and it's an amazing institution, has great relationships with a lot of the retailers, not just in Canada, but overseas. Right. Right. And we were just before Walmart CEO. And I was just astonished how transparent he was with the challenges they're having as, as a business but where they want to take the organization and this whole idea of services and what they're doing with healthcare and their next clinic that they're going to open up in the Atlanta market. Uh, And the fact that he he shared two things, he had spent the week, the previous week, I think he was in the Kansas City market doing delivery. So Walmart has that new service where you go, they will actually bring the groceries into your house and put them in your refrigerator and, and the stuff in the pantry that even some people have invested in additional refrigerators in their garages and then Walmart will go in. And then somebody asked him, what's the uh, the attrition rate or the mm-hmm. churn, mm-hmm. as we would say in, in the world of SaaS software? Zero. Yeah. And that was just, that blew my mind. Yeah, because I think when Walmart first announced it, people were very skeptical as right. to what, you know, who's going to let a, a stranger into their house. Mm-hmm. But when he had said that, uh, that was um, surprising. Yeah. It's also point pick. That's one of point pickups yeah. clients. And I, yeah. and I think Tom was quite clear, like the great relationship they have with Walmart yeah. and how Walmart's being very progressive in this space and is not taking anything for granted. And I think is really trying to orient itself around customer service. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting. And that was it. You know, that's what we did at Barclays. And I think, you know, we're looking forward to, to 2020. 
It's a couple business trips that we have to tackle before the remainder of the year. And then we're going straight into, in the new year, NRF. Yep, we'll be at NRF, booth 1418. Yeah, and then yep. what's after NRF? Then we'll be attending uh, the FMI midwinter event. Mm -hmm. And I think that's it for until our until around March. God, that's so that's <laughs> that's not that far away. No, no, it's it's not. And we then we go through the whole thing all over again. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, before I let you go, I want to say happy holidays, and certainly looking forward to connecting you, with you guys for our next season of Digital yep. Grocer, which I think it's we're going to kick it off at NRF. Yeah, we're already lining up a lot of podcasts to be recorded in the booth. Yeah. I'd like to try video, add video to the mix. I think we need to. Yeah, just to people say you and I look alike. <laughs> well, well, I mean, people are going up to you. Oh, my great presentation at Barclays. Can yeah, I have and the I presentation? Just, yeah, and I, I say, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll thank you very much for the compliment. Sir, so you're not allowed to jaywalk. That wasn't me. <laughs> that was the other guy. <laughs> that was the other yeah. guy. So. so, hey, Mark, how do people get a hold of us? Uh, go to our website, www.mercatus.com. All of the contact details are there. Happy to hear from anyone. Awesome. And folks, if you want to hear anything specific in season three, just don't hesitate to send Mark and I some topics. Or if you think there's a guest that you'd like for us to interview, please let us know. And again, looking forward to catching up with you guys in 2020. Thank you. Thank you.